you have your Bibles today and you would open them with me to Luke the 19th chapter. Luke chapter 19. We're going to begin this afternoon at verse number 1. We're going to read through verse number 10. Amen. Luke 19. Reading verses 1 through 10. The King James text today reads, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans. And he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I will restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen. I love when the Lord gives me a good old-fashioned gospel message, and today that's exactly what He's given me. I hope and I pray it'll touch hearts. I hope it'll be a blessing if You'll bow your head with me one moment, Master, once again, God. We come before you, Lord, as the Word of God is about to be broken. The anointing of the Holy Ghost is the most valuable possession any man or woman of God can possibly possess. Lord, when you've called an individual to the ministry, it takes great courage and strength to stand up in the sacred desk and deliver the Word of God as you've laid it upon their heart to deliver it. It's not always received joyfully. It's not always received gleefully. Mm -hmm. Master, today many make fun of and many chide and ridicule those of us who would preach this wonderful message of Jesus of the cross, of the empty tomb, of the ascended Christ, of the soon coming King. The Lord, today the Word of God is able to change hearts. It's able to transform lives. But it cannot do these things unless the presence and power of God rides on every word. Master, today I ask that you would anoint this man of clay, that you would allow me to be your oracle at this hour. Let the word that I deliver be straight from the throne room of grace. And let it be received not only in the hearing, but in the heart of every hearer. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I'm talking to us today on the topic of no small matter. To understand the story of Zacchaeus, we must first understand what a publican was. The Word of God telling us that Zacchaeus was not only a publican, but he was the chief 
of the publicans. He was the supervisor, as it were, or the manager. A publican was generally a Jew who had been recruited by the occupying government of Rome to twist arms and forcefully, if necessary, extract money from their Jewish subjects throughout the territory of Israel or Palestine. A publican, the literal definition of the word publican from the Greek is a tax farmer. The literal interpretation, tax farmer, a publican was generally hated and despised. Now part of the benefits offered to most recruits for service to Rome was the right to extort and steal as much money from their fellow citizens as they could. All Rome wanted was the amount they required. Publicans were infamous for doing their fellow Jews dirty, getting away with as much money as they could through threats, coercion, and false accusation. Adding insult to injury, the publicans or the tax collectors were paid handsomely to begin with by the government of Rome. In most instances, the greed of a publican could not seemingly be satisfied. They had far more than most people had, and most of them, the publicans, wanted far more than they already had. Amen. We know people like that in our world today. They already have more than most people have, and yet their greed knows no boundary. They want more and more and more. Zacchaeus, mind you, was a man of small stature. In a word, he was short. When it was noised abroad that Jesus was en route through the city, Zacchaeus was interested in seeing him. No doubt Zacchaeus had heard about the Lord, but he had never had the opportunity of seeing the Lord in person. So he decided, I just want to see this fellow that everybody's talking about. But unfortunately, being shorter than the average man, he was not able to see through the crowds that had gathered to view Jesus as he passed through. And therefore, he resorted to running ahead and climbing a sycamore tree. From that high perch, he could see Jesus as he passed by. Oh, hallelujah. But what Zacchaeus did not anticipate was that while he was able to see Jesus, oh, 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 the Lord was able to see him. Hallelujah. Zacchaeus may have been a man of small stature, but sadly his sin was no small matter. You know, it's funny how people with physical limitations and social limitations, you know, they're not a very big person, so to speak. Whether it be physically or whether it be just in terms of the social hierarchy of their community. It's funny how people who aren't very big tend to gravitate toward positions that can elevate them and make them feel big. Amen. Now, for those of us who are fans of the Shrek series, the Shrek uh, franchise, you know that in the first Shrek movie, there's a fella who wants to be a king, and he's real tiny, he's real short. And everywhere he goes, he rides on his horse, he sticks his feet into these false legs that makes him look like he's much taller. But then when they lift him off the horse, the legs stay there, and boom, he's this little tiny thing. Oh, and he wants to be a king, so he wants to marry a princess so that he can officially become a king. I had a teacher when I was in middle school who was a little tiny fella. 
an Italian fellow, but he, he probably wasn't more than 4'11 or so. Well, I'm going to tell you, when I was 12 years old, I was as tall as I am now. Uh, actually, probably about an inch taller because I've shrunk a bit. I was 5'11 by the time I was 12. Most kids kind of hit a growth spurt a little bit later in life, you know, maybe as they're going into high school or at some point in high school. Not me. I just grew like a bull elephant, and by the time I was 12, I already was my full height and stout, pretty, you know, I wasn't a fat or a heavy person. Had a 32-inch waist, but I, you know, I was a, uh, I forget the word, the husky. That's the word they use. I was a husky fella, you know. And uh, this particular teacher in middle school, man, this guy, he taught social studies. And he gave me more grief and more trouble, more aggravation. I would go out of my way to try to do well in his class. I would go out, I would do extra credit. I would do all kinds of stuff. And this man still insisted on giving me less than adequate grades for my work. Believe me, I, you know, I should have had an A. And he'd be lucky if he'd give me a B or a B minus. He just, he just was not wanting to give me credit. That's kind of a little problem I've been through my whole life with folks wanting to give me credit for the work, for what I do. His name was Mr. Capo. He's probably dead now, so I think I'm safe saying the name. And I went home and I told my mother, I said, oh, I'm telling you, Mr. Capo, that guy's got it in for me. He does not like me. And my mother said, well, why in the world would you say that? Why would you think a teacher cared, you know, uh, didn't care for you? Why would you say that? I said, he's a little tiny fellow, and honestly, I think it aggravates him that I'm one of the few kids in school that just towers over him. I think that frustrates him. Well, to be honest, my mother didn't immediately believe me that Mr. Capo wasn't crazy about me. Well, the time came after, I believe, after the first report card was issued for the year, and they had, you know, parent-teacher conferences where parents go to the school and they get to meet your teachers and talk to your teachers. My mother went to a parent-teacher conference and met my teachers and she came home and she said, you know what? You're right. She said, that capo does not like you. She said, boy, I'll tell you what. She said, I could tell in talking to him that he just had a bad attitude about you, that was nothing you were going to do to win his favor, there was nothing in the world you were going to do. But you know, Mr. Capo was a short fella. And short fellas sometimes, now those of you watching, if you're a little fella, I think short fellas like that are absolutely adorable. And, and I don't mean that in a, you know, like, oh, you know, I'm admiring a little child. That's not what I mean. I think, I think little short people are beautiful. I love uh, a pretty little short girl or a pretty little short fellow. I happen to think, personally, I think it's petiteness and smallness is very attractive. Now that's for me. Not everybody feels that way, but I do. And you know, we, we all can't be 6'4 and 230 pounds. You know, I'm certainly not. But I want to tell you, my mother come home realizing that Mr. Capo really did have it in for me, and it was fairly obvious to her that it really had to do with his height and my height compared to him. Isn't it funny, though, have you ever met somebody who's either small of stature or socially, I hate to use the word, but socially insignificant, you know, they really don't have any particular social significance. And all of a sudden, they want to be a policeman. Oh yeah, you know why? Because when I put on that outfit, it doesn't matter that I'm five foot six. When I put on that uniform and I'm wearing that badge and I got that gun on my hip, I'm somebody special. I've got authority. I'm able to wield it over you. You know what I'm talking? You know people like that? I'm going to tell you folks, uh, I've got an idea that this is how Rome was able to take advantage of a lot of people in the Jewish world. 
They find people who wanted to up their status in the world. They wanted to be somebody. They, there was something about them that was lacking. And they were trying to compensate for that. And that may very well be why Zacchaeus had become a tax collector. Because being a tax collector, it didn't matter how little he was, boy, he had it over you. Man, he could rob you blind. He could send people to jail just at the word of his mouth, saying you refuse to pay your tribute, you refuse to pay your taxes. I'm sure Zacchaeus had a lot more going on in his life than just his height. He probably had some psychological and or emotional issues that helped lend to his wanting to become a tax collector. The Lord called Zacchaeus in our story today down from the tree. And one of the interesting things about this is he called him out by name to come down. Because Jesus said, I want to spend the day in your home. This was a manifestation of the divinity of Christ. He shocked Zacchaeus by calling him down by name. How in the world, Lord, would you know my name? How in the Lord would you know who I am? I've heard of you and I was looking for you. You weren't out looking for me. You just happened upon me. But the word of God said he looked up. I believe Jesus looked up because he knew Zacchaeus was there to begin with. Amen. He looked up and called Zacchaeus down by name while standing in the street before the Lord. And Zacchaeus confessed his sin of thievery and false witness, vowing to pay back everyone he had stolen from, exhorted, or coerced. And he promised to pay them back fourfold. He also vowed to give half his goods to the poor. Oh, I'm going to tell you, this is a man who had an encounter with Jesus. I'm going to tell you, if you have a genuine encounter with Jesus and you don't feel motivated to make some things right, then honey, you ain't had a genuine encounter with Jesus. There's something about having an encounter with the Lord that moves you to want to do right moves you to want to make things right. Mm -hmm. The question I have for you today is what do we learn from the story of Zacchaeus? Well, the first thing we learn today is that no one is too lost to find grace in the eyes of the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. It doesn't matter where you are, what you're doing, what you've done, who you've done it with. I'm here to tell you today, don't you let the enemy convince you falsely that you cannot be saved. You cannot be born again. Oh, but pastor, you don't know what I've done. Honey, there was nobody in this world had more sin and trouble behind him than Zacchaeus. Mm -hmm. Nobody, and I mean nobody, is too lost to be able to find grace in the eyes of the Lord. So many feel that where they have been and what they have done has made them far too sinful to ever be able to find grace in the eyes of the Lord. But when Zacchaeus was trying to see the Lord, he was also, listen to me now, making himself visible to Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm going to tell you, you make a little effort to see God. You make a little effort to draw close to the Lord. And all you're doing is making yourself more visible to God. Amen. Amen. When we make an effort to see Him, He responds in kind. And He will acknowledge us. Listen, inviting Himself into our lives. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm so glad Jesus didn't sit around waiting for me to invite him. Hallelujah. He called Zacchaeus down from the tree. Said, Zacchaeus, come on down, son. I'm going to your house today. I'm going to eat with you today. I'm going to spend the day with you today. I thank God for the day when Jesus and I met and the Lord said, Chuck, we're going to sit down and have us a meal together. We're going to get to know one another. Glory to God. God doesn't have to wait for you to invite him. 
do it by himself. Thank you, Lord. Oh, my Lord. And he invites himself into our lives because he hopes to establish a permanent bond and a lasting relationship. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, the word of the Lord says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. Hallelujah. Jesus doesn't sit around waiting for you to come to him. Thank no. Thank goodness. All he has to do is give you the opportunity. He said, listen, I'm here, you're here. You know what? Let's go eat. Let's go get a meal. Amen. Let's go get something to eat. Oh, I want to tell you today, folks, you're in a place right now where Jesus is. You're in a place right now where the presence of God is, where the power of God is, the Spirit of God is, today the Lord is speaking to you and saying, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice, any man, he doesn't say you have to be a righteous man. Doesn't say you have to be a good man. Doesn't say you have to be a clean man. Doesn't say you have to be a straight man. He said, if any man hear my voice, if you hear the Lord speaking to you today, if you hear the voice of God calling out to you today, invite Him in. Tell Him, come on in, Lord. Let's eat. Hallelujah. In Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35, Peter is speaking at the house of Cornelius, a Roman soldier. Cornelius invited him in because an angel of the Lord instructed him to send for a man named Peter and told him where Peter could be found. Mm -hmm. If there was anybody in this world that the early church didn't think was qualified to be saved, it would have been Cornelius. Why? Well, for one thing, he's Roman. He's not a Jew. He's a Gentile. Number two, the Romans have a reputation for being some of the most ungodly and wicked people on the face of the planet. And number three, we hate these people because they've occupied and colonized our country. Right. And yet, Peter speaks to the house of Cornelius and says this in verses 34 and 35, Acts chapter 10. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive, listen, that God is no respecter of persons. Hallelujah! But in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness. If you have any desire in your heart at all to act right and live right and do right, Peter said, In every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. There is no such thing as being too lost. Hallelujah. There is no such thing as being too sinful. There is no such thing as being too too far uh, in false doctrine or false teaching or false belief. Honey, no. You have the opportunity today to have an encounter with Jesus. He's passing by. Hallelujah. Secondly, we learn from the story of Zacchaeus today that while we may feel small and insignificant, having to force our way through the crowds and climbing a tree to see the Lord. You ever feel like that? People going into the church and you feel like the last thing in the world the Lord wants to see is you, the last person in the world. I've had people come to churches that I've been trying to build and they've said to me, I was afraid the building would collapse if I came into the house of God. But I'm here to tell you, while you may feel like you have to force your way through the crowds and climb a tree just to see Jesus, I've got news for you. The Lord is on the lookout for you. Hallelujah. The prodigal son was on his way home to his father when the Word of God tells us that his father saw him coming. Dad was looking for his son to return. 
He was not living his life as though his son were dead, but rather anticipated the return of his son who was lost. God knows, oh hallelujah, God knows where you are. He will never give up on you and he will never stop anticipating your tearful return. In Luke chapter 15, verses 17 through 20, And when he came to himself, speaking of the backslidden prodigal son, he said, How many hired servants of my father have bread enough in to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. Listen, verse 20, Luke 15. And he arose and came to his father. Oh, hallelujah. Listen, listen, listen. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. <laughs> hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, my God. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. Oh, honey, I'm here to tell you, 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 you start making a move in God's direction. He doesn't wait till you get to his doorstep. He sees you coming while you're yet a great way off. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Listen, and have compassion. Oh, God isn't looking at you today through the eyes of judgment. God isn't looking at you today through the eyes of condemnation. God is looking at you today through the eyes of compassion. And, and the Word of God said the Father ran and fell on His neck and kissed Him. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you, you're so afraid of coming back to God. Don't know what the Lord's reaction might be. Well, I'm here to tell you today, honey, He's got a big hug and a kiss waiting for you. He's so anxious for your return. He's watching. He's looking. And if you make any effort at all toward Him, He will make ten times that effort toward you. The Word of God declares in James chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. God don't wait for you to make the whole journey alone. Hallelujah. Jesus. If you make any effort in his direction, Zacchaeus climbed the tree, and Jesus stopped under the tree, looked up and said, Come on down, Zacchaeus. I'm going to eat with you. Hallelujah. Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. Oh, bless the name of the Lord. What else do we learn from the story of Zacchaeus today? We learn that Jesus knows us. That He knows us by name. God doesn't have to wait until we meet Him to know who we are, where we have been, and what we have done. Nor does he need to wait until we've made full restitution and repented before he will gladly come and abide with us. We may be lost having walked away from the rest of God's family as Zacchaeus walked away from the rest of Israel, from the, the rest of his Jewish brethren, working for the enemy and living as prosperously as one can live while deep in sin and debauchery. But our situation today is known to the Lord. If we could surprise Him with tales of our antics and our evils, it might be that He would not receive us. But there's nothing you can tell Him about yourself that He does not already know. Jeremiah 1 verses 4 and 5, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet 
unto the nations. The Lord told the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah, you weren't even formed in your mother's womb. And I already knew you and I already had plans for you. I've got news for you today. Jesus knows you. He called Zacchaeus by name because the Lord doesn't have to wait to be introduced. Amen. He knew you long before you were even an apple in daddy's eye. Amen. In John chapter 1 verses 44 through 50 we read the story. Now Philip was of Bethsaida the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael and saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him. Again, Nathanael hadn't even reached the Lord. He's coming to him and saith of him, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael saith unto him, Whence knowest thou me? He said, Have we met? <laughs> Do we know one another? Jesus answered and said unto him, before that Philip called thee, listen, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Wow. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, bless the Lord. Nathanael answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, Believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. Hallelujah. Mm. Think God doesn't know you. You think the Lord doesn't know where you're coming from. You think the Lord doesn't know what you've been up to and what's been going on in your life. Guess again. You don't need to do any great thing for the Lord to see you. He saw Zacchaeus and called him by name as, as, as Zacchaeus sat on the branch of a tree. He also saw Nathaniel, listen, as he sat under a fig tree. Uh -huh. Although he was nowhere near that location. So whether you're up in a tree trying to mm -hmm. see him, or whether you're off in the distance under a tree and have no knowledge of him whatsoever, God knows where you're at. Thank you. Hallelujah. Yes. Praise the name of the Lord. John chapter 2 verses 23 through 25. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Listen, but Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. Verse 25, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. What does that mean? That means simply this. Jesus never one time had to be introduced to somebody. He never one time had to hear an introduction. He never one time had to be given a referral or a recommendation. The Word of God said He literally knew. He knew what was in the heart of every person He met. He never had to hear a word about anybody because He knew. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you today, if you think God doesn't know where you're at, if you think the Lord doesn't understand your place in life, if you don't, if you think the Lord doesn't get you, oh my goodness, friend, understand, Zacchaeus was called down from the tree by name. Jesus knows you. Trust me. Yes. He knows you. Amen. He's seen yes. you. He sees you up in the tree. He sees you under the fig tree. Oh, nowhere have you been that God has not been aware of you. Lastly today, from the story of Zacchaeus, we learn that repentance is manifested in meat for repentance. 
or actions which illustrate and demonstrate we have genuinely experienced a change of heart and a change of mind. We have genuinely changed our direction and are seeking to follow after God. Turning from unbelief to faith, desiring to walk with the Lord and to walk according to His ways, it ought to be our heart's desire to make right those things which we now can correct as Zacchaeus wanted to make right. He said, oh, I've, I've defrauded people. I've stolen from people. I've caused people grief through false witness. He said, but I'm prepared right now to make it right. Hallelujah. I'm prepared right now to pay back and make it right. It is not enough to correct our path and to move forward in the right direction. It's also important that we seek to settle wrongs we have committed in the past as a means of demonstrating a changed heart and a soul that has found grace. Even in the AA 10-step program, they have... Uh, a step that they call making amends. Amen. And that's where you go to people that during the course of your addiction, you may have hurt people you may have offended, people you may have treated wrong, people you may have done dirty, and confessing and acknowledging that wrong so that you can make it right. Amen. Making amends. Folks, that is the byproduct of having an encounter with Jesus. Yes. It's not just a matter of, okay, I'm going to do right from this day forward. I'm going to do everything in my power to do the right thing moving forward. No. Within us there ought to be some desire to go back and to make things right that we can make right. We can't always make everything right. But there ought to be some desire in us to make things right in the past so that we can move forward knowing that we have taken care of past business. Amen. I, I wasn't aware of how wrong I did from somebody. I wasn't aware of how much I hurt them. But when I came to know the Lord, I'll tell you, I had an opportunity to go back and to make things right. I've gone to people and I've confessed to them things from years and years ago. I've had people tell me, I didn't even know you did that. When I started my first church, I wasn't but 19 years old. And I had a pastor as a kid. He had a very, very difficult job. The pastor of my church had moved only one city away, one city up north. He moved from Naugatuck, Connecticut to Waterbury, which is a bigger city. Waterbury is more of a city. Naugatuck is just a, a large town. And our pastor moved one city up the road. That's it. Now, this is very unusual. You don't normally see preachers doing stuff like this. The church in Waterbury had pretty much gone defunct. It no longer was operating. But they had a little building and, you know, everything. So the Assemblies of God wanted to revive the work there. So they made an arrangement with Brother Barlow to move up to Waterbury and restart the work. Well, now, the, the, the bad thing about this is when you have a popular pastor and he moves up the road one city, guess what happens? Well, half the church goes with him. So with the denomination's blessing, they basically split our church, mm -hmm. which really was wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, then we get a new pastor who comes in and bless his heart. He's got to deal with, if people here now get the least bit mad at him or upset with him or whatever, guess what they do? They just go up the road to the church in Waterbury. So he wound up in a really tough spot, a very difficult position. He was a good man. He is, so far as I know, he's still a good man. And I loved him. But my grandmother was a critical sort of person. She could find fault with Jesus. 
And she loved to sit in judgment of decisions the pastor made and, you know, things like that. And I got to tell you, growing up in that environment, I'd be lying if I said that I wasn't just like her. I most certainly was. Well, there were many discussions I had with different people in the church and members of my family about how Brother Harmon hadn't done this quite right or he hadn't done that or he should have done this or he should have done that. You know, my critical mouth just flailing and flopping all over the place. Well, when it come time to start my first church, I thought about the Word of God, and I, I believe Scripture, folks. I'm going to tell you, there are too many people in this world, they, they just don't take the Word of God seriously. I do. And there was a little passage in the Bible that just came back and haunted me, and that is, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And I thought to myself, I'm about to start my first church and I have sat in the shadows and criticized and found fault with the pastor and I've sat there and voiced my you know, criticisms with other members of the church and I'm about to start a church and you know what? I really don't want people doing that to me. It's not helpful. It's not constructive. It can destroy a church. Thank God my mouth never, you know, I, I didn't run around the church creating division and strife. You know, it usually was just conversations with other family members and what have you. Long story short, I called Brother Harmon. He had moved on. He now was pastoring a church, I believe at the time it was either in Pennsylvania or New Jersey. I called him on the telephone and I was talking to him and I said, Brother Harmon, I need to confess something to you. I need to tell you about something. You know, I used to sit in judgment of you and criticize you when you were pastoring, and I second-guessed many of the things you did and many of the decisions you made. I said, and I'm genuinely sorry. I, you know, I, I shouldn't have done that. And Brother Harmon said to me, he said, Chuck, I don't ever remember having a single problem in the world with you. I don't remember ever there being any problem with you. And I said, well, that's the problem. I did it, but it was behind your back. I say, well, now, Brother Charles, if it was behind his back, why'd you have to go and open your big mouth and tell him that it happened? He could have died an old man and never known you even did those things. He could have. But then when I face off God in the judgment, honey, I'm going to have to answer for those things. I'm going to have to answer for that conduct. But see, God's given us an out. He's given us the ability to settle debts here, to settle issues here, so that when we face Him in the judgment, guess what? That issue will never come up. You remember where Jesus said, Whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. People love to misinterpret that. They love to misrepresent uh, what that means. But that literally means the term bind and loose is a contractual term. You've heard of the term. They had a binding contract, right? When the Lord said, whatsoever you bind on earth, He literally was saying, when you come to terms on something on earth, if you've wronged somebody and you confess it to them, whether they knew it or not, and they forgive you, guess what? That matter is bound. You have a binding contract. That issue will not face you in the judgment. You will not have to answer for that in the judgment. This is why I tell people, it's very unwise to leave a church ticked off at the pastor. It's very unwise to just run off and be mad at people and not ever to go to them and tell them and speak to them and give an opportunity to make amends. Because, honey, you may think you're in the right and you better hope you're in the right because if you're not in the right, you're going to answer for that one day. So we have an opportunity to go into our past. We have an opportunity like Zacchaeus to make things right. 
not merely to move forward seeking to do right from this day on, but also going into the past and settling issues so that they are forever settled in heaven. In Acts chapter 26, 19 and 20, the Apostle Paul testifies before King Agrippa, and he says, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient unto the heavenly vision, speaking of his conversion experience. He said, but showed first unto them of Damascus and at Jerusalem and throughout all the coasts of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God, but listen, and do works meet for repentance. In other words, settle some old issues, settle some things, do things. You know, repentance is not about merely a change of heart or a change of mind. It's about a change in direction and the way we do things. And you don't just change from this day forward, but if you're able to go back and fix some things you did in the past, that is bringing forth meat for repentance. You're demonstrating a penitent heart. In Matthew 3, 5 through 8, then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins, speaking of John the Baptist. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you? to flee the wrath to come. Bring forth, therefore, fruits, meat for repentance. He said, act like you've repented. Don't just come here to be baptized. Behave like you've genuinely repented. Let's see you do some things that demonstrates a penitent heart. Go back and make right some of the things you've done wrong. Go back and bring healing to situations where you've brought damage and a wound. Amen. In Ephesians, the Word of God tells us, chapter 4, verse 28, Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. You know, when you repent, it's not just about changing your mind. It's about changing actions. He said, at one time you were a thief. He said, well, now use your hands to do something constructive so that you're able to help people. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Okay, the same hands you used to steal with, now you can build things with. You can help build homes. You can help build furniture. You can help uh, farm food. You know, you can do things to benefit others instead of hurting others because repentance is marked by action not merely by word oh I'm here to tell you this afternoon there is peace and joy in making past wrongs right a forgiven heart seeks to right wrongs of the past and to move forward doing the right thing we want to tell the world not just with words but with actions that God has granted us grace and forgiven our sins. You know, you may be a lot today like Zacchaeus. You may have a pile of sins behind you. You may look at your sins and say, you know what, my sin is no small matter. I got a lot of stuff there. It's no small matter to deal with my sin. Honey, I backslid and left church for a few years, and I will not go into detail. I won't give the devil the pleasure of recounting some of the things I've done and said and places I've been. And I'll tell you what, I guarantee you there aren't very many of you out there who could outdo me. I didn't drink. I didn't do drugs, but I sure did an awful lot of other things that I'm ashamed of. But my past does not have to dictate, dictate my present, and it most certainly does not have to have any bearing on my future. Because I'm here to tell you today, the Lord knows who you are. If you'll make any effort in His direction at all, He'll meet you. 
He'll meet you in the middle. Amen. Amen. Draw nigh unto God. He'll draw nigh unto you. Yes. Glory to God. He knows where you've been. He knows what you've done. There ain't nothing. Nowhere you've been that surprises God. You can't tell Him a story of something you've done or somewhere you've been or someone you've wronged. You cannot tell Him a story and the Lord say, hmm, I didn't realize that. Hmm, I didn't know that. That changes things. No, 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 no. Honey, like the prodigal son's father, he's just waiting for you to come back. When you start making an effort toward God, you're going to be surprised because far off, the father's looking for that wayward child. Hallelujah. He's looking for you. He's not looking to criticize. He's not looking to bruise. He's not looking to condemn. He's looking with love. He wants to hug you. He wants to kiss you. He wants to welcome you back into his family and into his household. Oh, your sin today may be no small matter, but God sees you. He knows your name. He desires to dwell with you and to sup with you. I just want to ask you today, will you answer his call and welcome him into your life? Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. I'm grateful for the opportunity to just preach a good old-fashioned gospel message. Amen. Good news. Good news. Yes, amen. Good news. Amen. Would you stand with me this afternoon?